Let's start with the story of this one single person whose actions have influenced the geopolitics of technology, right? His actions have single-handedly shaped intellectual property rights globally. He started off as a revolutionary tech mogul in uh, late 70s, early 80s, and since then has went on to become a philanthropist in a completely different field. In fact, he's considered the embodiment of the word philanthropy. Any guesses as to who this person is? Well, he was once the richest person on earth, of course, Bill Gates. So Bill Gates is often labeled as this monopolist who strives for stronger patent laws and is against patent waivers. Now let's look at it from his angle, right? So a patent helps a com company protect its intellectual property and earn profit. Now when you waive a patent, that company doesn't get economic compensation. So that company doesn't really have motive to innovate further. So this is all fair and good. Jump to the other side. Developing countries need patent waivers to grow because they need cheap technologies. And patents just increase the cost of technology because it becomes monopolistic. Now, all of these uh, rights and wrongs aside, let's consider this one thing that happened right when COVID started. So in 2020, India and South Africa filed a motion with TRIPS, which is the Council for Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights an organization with the World Trade Organization. And the uh, motion was simple. To temporarily waive patent laws related to COVID-19 life-saving medication and equipment. Now, this was not well supported by G7 and the other economic powerhouses of the world, right? So, it was finally, a watered-down version was finally approved in late 2022, when the brunt of the pandemic was already over. Now, this is how much geopolitics shapes technologies. This is uh, the sheer scale of how life-saving medication couldn't reach the needy. Now, again, uh, I, I want you to keep ethics and your own personal beliefs about it aside. What, the reason I share this story is for two reasons. Firstly, to explain to you what is the basis of technological progress globe over. And we're talking on a geopolitical scale. So, there are only two things. First, su survival. Countries want to survive in all the uh, meaning of, it, of that term. So survival is maintaining that baseline. And then you have growth. Growth is pushing forward that baseline, pushing it up. These are the only two bases of technologies growing. That is survival and growth. And this helps con con countries get competitive edges, etc., etc. So this begs the question, what should the modern day economy be? Should it what should the modern day economy be? Should it be competition driven or collaboration driven? So in this respect, uh, I'm going to leave this question as is here for a second and we're going to come back at, at the very end of this talk, right? So I want you to consider uh, this brain drain. So firstly, we've talked about flow of technology. Let's talk about flow of people. So uh, would you say brain drain is a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, let's consider it from a developed country standpoint first. So a developed country is all the motives for getting talent, right? They get talent, therefore they get diversity, they, diversity, they get uh, more intellectual property, more productivity and economic growth. Now let's talk about brain drain, the most controversial topic in India. Is brain drain good or bad? Now everyone has their own opinions. I'm going to argue, maybe it's not as bad a thing as it is portrayed. You know, as uh, our Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Jayashankar describes, the world is like a membrane. People flow through. So in, the, in that regard, uh, it's inevitable. But let's discuss how we can play to our advantage here. So in this whole uh, thing, if there is brain drain, there's reverse brain drain too. So if people go out, people come back. And when they come back, they come back with refreshed ideas and a fresh mindset on how to grow the country. First argument. Second, Indians last year on NRIs outside sent 112 billion US dollars back to India. I don't think this warrants any further explanation as to why this is a good thing. And the most important argument, according to me, is that when Indians go abroad and work on a technology, they shape it according to Indian ideas, values, and circumstances. And India is already the world's largest market. India is already um, has the largest population single on a single piece of land. So in essence, when that technology is being shaped, it's being shaped Indocentrically, which helps our national uh, agendas to a very huge extent. 
So we've talked about flow of uh, technology, we've talked about flow of people. This is all how geopolitics shapes technology. Let's talk about how technology shapes geopolitics. And here I'm going to talk to you about propaganda. So each country wants to shape its own narrative. Each country wants people outside and people inside to have, you know, this perception of greatness, this specific perception. And that's basically what a narrative is. Historically, it has been the press that controls the narrative. But today, increasingly, more and more, it is the technology that controls narratives. And at that, there's one in particular. I, I know every one of, each one of you knows it's AI. So if you've used things like Google Bard, ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera. So when you consider uh, the Israel-Palestine wall, a curious incident happened. So on 24th of November, uh, October, I asked Google Bard and ChatGPT two questions. Do Palestinians deserve justice? Do Israelis deserve justice? Do Israelis deserve justice? Both of them say, yes, fundamental human right, irrespective of nationality, irrespective of nationality. Do Palestinians deserve justice? It says it's a complex and a multifaceted issue. This just gives you the scale of, where, uh, scale of this problem where the AI model is contradicting itself. You know, uh, at one place you are saying it's irrespective of nationality and at the other place it's a complex issue. And this is not something that's you know, being fed into that AI model. It's just the way the digital world is. Some countries own way more internet assets than other countries and that causes some countries to have a more say in the narrative globally and then subsequently even um, on the AI model which propagates. Now, hold on, there's more. Uh, wait, so just to give you a, a scale of this whole thing. India, 20% of the world population, right? India owns only 0.5% of the websites globally, domains. This gives you the scale of how huge this thing is. Now, one, two weeks later, I asked it the same question on 11th of November. And this time, the response is flipped. So ChatGPT is fixed in a time. It has the same response. But Google Bard, on the other hand, for Palestinians, yes, fundamental, issue, uh, fundamental right. But for Israelis, it's a complex issue. Now, this just, this just blew my mind. And why did this happen? Because over this period, there was so much outcry for Palestine that uh, the AI model was forced to change its opinion. So this is how much geopolitics influences technology and subsequently technology influences uh, geopolitics. So this goes to the basis of uh, whether a country has the right to control its own narrative and countries need to control their own narrative because that's what narrative is history, right? Narrative is history. So you're writing your own history and you need to write your own history because that's what will project your future. Now let's talk about sovereignty here. So this relates to sovereignty and now let's talk about technological sovereignty. Country need, countries need to uh, have the right to you know, use technologies as according to their needs. So that is technological sovereignty. And let's talk about uh, that in context of Web3 and specifically cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies, as you all know, are this very uh, decentralized thing that you cannot regulate. So even if you cannot uh, regulate, the government needs to have control over finance, over commerce, and because it's the most basic thing to being a country. Now, this is very unlikely to ever happen that, you know, cryptocurrencies will take place of normal currencies because cryptocurrencies are very techn technologically for the niche. So a more real world example of technological sovereignty is the threat from China. So if you, it's, it's like this, you pit China against the rest of the world and that is a match of technological sovereignty because Bitcoin doesn't have a central, central farm at one place, central server farm at one place. It has these mining farms located across the globe, right? And they are private players. So China owns majority of the uh, private players in China own majority of the mining farms. So in theory, China could initiate a distributed denial of service or a 51% attack. That is, they could just spoof the systems and subsequently cause implications on the global no traditional financial system as well because it's inextricably linked, linked to each other. Now, this is described as a utopic scenario which is unlikely to happen, but I'm going to argue it's not. Why? Because number one, even if they are private players, China is the most centralized and opaque economy known to man. Second, China is also a struggling economy, so you cannot discount this off as just a random possibility because it, it can be real very soon. Now, let's talk about 
something that has already happened, an incident related to technological sovereignty, and that is in reference to the Russo-Ukrainian war. So in this war, Ukraine was being given internet assets by uh, SpaceX through Starlink. And just when Ukraine was about to launch its own uh, offensive drone attack on Russia, internet was stopped. And the reasoning that SpaceX gave was there were, fe there were fears of nuclear retaliation by Russia. So, uh, again, morality, right or wrongs, and the truth value aside, a country needs to have control over its own technology. Now, this is not their technology, and I'm going to come to that in a second. This is not their technology, but you need to have control over technology. And talking about uh, Ukraine in specific, what should a country in position of Ukraine do? Number one, they are a small country. And this is, this is all with foresight, right? So they are a small country, so they need collaboration with larger countries, and as they were doing with the US in terms of SpaceX. But at the same time, they need to become competent in their own technological resources, but also uh, in their relationships with other countries, so that they're not singularly dependent on one economy. They have diversity in this whole thing. You know, talking about SpaceX, the best uh, example of an understanding that you can get of why there is geopolitics and technology and all these things is the space ecosystem. So why is there um, geopolitics around technology? Soft power, diplomacy, and bilateral relations. Countries want to develop a stronger uh, influence on the global stage, stronger dominance, and want to cultivate soft power. And what space is about is soft power. Why does a country like the US need a space force, a space military, when there's no other country competent enough to get into that sphere? Why, does, why do developing countries like India need to invest in space technology? And strictly speaking, from a geopolitical standpoint here, not scientific, we need to invest so that we have power. Because smaller nations will be ultimately dependent on the larger nations for their space capabilities. And that gives you soft power and influence in the long run, that uh, which you could use today, but those countries, the smaller ones which are dependent on you, will use these things in the long run. So, uh, what should the policy be? What should we do? I say internally. Now, uh, my previous co-speaker, Mr. Paresh, said uh, one thing, that we are the nation of startups because we have problems. So we have problems, we need to become competent, we need to become competitive about it, even internally. So I say a country like India internally should have this policy of competitive collaboration. So uh, states, institutions, and people should become more competitive with this central goal of collaboratively advancing the country. That is competitive collaboration. While externally, you need to become collaboratively competitive. That is, see, the world is divided into nation states because we are all different, and that difference brings competition. So you have to realize that competition is always going to be there, but you need to become collaborative about that competition. And the best example here is the Russo-Ukrainian war, one where I give that you have to balance these two. And what is India already doing, our country? We, are, we have soft power, we have collaboration. How? In COVID-19, uh, when no other country was willing to provide vaccines, we provided it free of cost to other developing nations. Soft power, influence. We have Make in India. We are becoming competent in terms of manufacturing. We don't have to be dependent anymore. We are dependent, but we are going away from that dependence, right? We are becoming more competent. And I say, we not only need to make in India, but we need to make in India first. Because that's the only way you can drive research and development. And you know, we have to break this cycle of being followers and we have to step out in front and become the leaders in the technological space because that's what, is, that's what the world in the future is ultimately going to be about and has been for the past few months. Those who innovate and use that strategically are the ones that lead. Now, um, mark my words, the day we are able to ingrain all of these things, we are able to balance uh, collaboration and competition, the day we are able to uh, make in India and make in India first will be the day that we unleash the unstoppable force that is India. Jai Hind. Thank you.